welcome to day four of the EACD 2021 and this session on the future of technology and innovation. My name is Erik Domelöv and I will serve as the moderator for uh, this session. And we have two, uh, what I believe will be very exciting communications coming up. Um, we will move on to the presentations without further hesitation, but I'd like to first encourage the audience that if you have any questions, don't hesitate to use the Q&A chat function uh, to the right, and um, we will get to your question at the end of the session. And when you do use the Q&A function, please follow the format for questions given. All right, first, out we have Anne Kern. Uh, Anne is uh, the head of communication of Cybathlon in Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, Cybathlon is uh, an international multi sport event where people with disability compete to complete everyday tasks using advanced technical assistance systems. So, this will be very interesting to hear about. Anne, please. Thank you, Eric. Um, hello, everybody. I would like to start the introduction um, to the Cybertron with our vision or with the question, a world without barriers. Um, about this question, you can make um, up your mind the next 45 minutes, what this means to you. I will um, sh shortly um, show you a video about what the Cybertron um, is doing and why we are having this um, platform um, created six years ago. Cybathlon is more than a competition. Cybathlon is emotion and innovation. It moves people and technology. Numerous teams from all over the world compete against and with each other with one common vision, a world without barriers. Around 15% of the world's population lives with some form of disability and often face barriers in their daily life. And this despite of 175 countries which have committed to removing barriers, protecting people with disabilities against discrimination and promoting their inclusion and equality in society by signing the UN Disability Rights Convention. Assistive technologies can help people with disability overcome some of the challenges in their daily life. But unfortunately, the acquisition and use of such technologies are still difficult for various reasons. Sometimes research projects do not sufficiently consider the needs of the people concerned. Due to political factors, high production costs and prices, many people can't even afford assistive technologies. The inclusion of people with disabilities in everyday life is often limited for those reasons. Awakened by these observations, Professor Robert Rehner from ETH Zurich initiated the non-profit project Cybathlon in 2013. He believed competitions would be the best way to drive the development of new assistive technologies and to raise public awareness of the challenges people with disabilities encounter. The idea was well received by scientists as well as people with disabilities, but also the great response of the media and the public encouraged Professor Robert Rehner to develop his initiative further. Since then, many international competitions have been held. Broad attention is guaranteed when teams from all over the world present their many years of research and development in assistive technologies to a large audience on the Cybathlon platform. The competition is unique for the audience and especially for the participating teams. Teams are motivated to continuously improve their technologies and to bring research forward and thus push a sustainable improvement in the quality of life for people with disabilities. For a world without barriers. Speak now, everyone has seen the video. <laughs> now I can speak, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, perfect. <laughs> so, 
Um, I hope you could all see the video and what um, Cybertron is about, because I'm very sorry I couldn't see it. That um, made it a bit hard for me. Um, but I did, uh, maybe I did something wrong. So um, the Cybertron um, is not only the competition you saw on the video, it's also um, a platform to exchange. So you have the people with disabilities and the research and development of new assistive technology. And um, one of the most important groups you have to include in those encounter is the society and the public, because without the society and every one of us, there won't be an inclusion of people with disabilities. Um, um, in addition, we want to show this society and the public um, the chances and limitations of new assistive technologies. So there is um, still a lot to do that um, assistive technologies can support people with disabilities in daily life. And um, it's not that um, they can fly around like um, Iron Man in the sci-fi movie. It's, it's still, still very, very um, limited um, features that technologies have. So these are the six disciplines of the Cybertron. Um, the first one is the powered arm prosthesis race. And um, we include pilots with above wrist amputation. That means um, they have to be amputated um, or have a stump here. So because it's very um, necessary to rebuild the, 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 the whole hand and to, to have um, this, um, this kind of action with, with your hand. Then we have the powered leg prosthesis race with um, pilots above, with above knee amputations because it's very um, difficult to rebuild a knee. And um, this is why we include this in our races in rules that um, people, um, that the research and developers have to come up with um, good and convenient solutions for, for people with above knee amputations. Here you can see this is a very um, interesting prosthesis. Um, it's made of um, plastic. It's a recycled prosthesis for, um, uh, at the moment, African countries. That is a, a, a startup um, in Zurich um, who is uh, educating people in Kenya to to use this prosthesis and to make it by themselves from um, plastic bottles. This is the powered wheelchair race. So pilots with um, walking disabilities can um, take part um, in this discipline. Then we have the powered exoskeleton race. There we um, include pilots with complete paraplegia so that they don't have any um, movement in their um, lower body. We have the functional electrical stimulation bike race. This is um, the fifth discipline that um, are pilots with complete paraplegia. And we have the um, brain-computer interface race. It's not working. Um, here, pilots with um, tetraplegia um, compete in this um, race. It's um, mostly they compete with EEG caps um, in a computer game. We we develop together with experts that they can play against each other with their thoughts. So we use, um, as you see, saw in the video, we use this competition as an accelerator. We are having a, a main event every four years. The first Cybertron was in 2016. Um, here you can see the, the picture of the stadium in Zurich. The second Cybertron was supposed to be in the same stadium in 2020, but as you all know, <laughs> we couldn't um, have it there. So we decided to um, move this um, big event to, um, to all home basis of the participating teams. So um, we organized a decentralized Cybertron. Every team had to build their own Cybertron and we created um, a live production of this um, competition. So the last Cybertron was in November 2020 and the next Cybertron will be in 2024, when exactly is to be decided. And we, we are currently um, 
creating new tasks and um, we are sticking with um, the six disciplines, but um, we might um, also have a, a discipline for, 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 um, for blind people, but this is still not, not uh, really set yet. But um, we are um, or creating the task and the races and rules and the teams can register for the new competition and then they have to develop their device according to those races and rules to solve all the everyday tasks. As I said, the teams are the main driver. So a team consists of a people with a disability. We call them pilots and um, a technology provider that can be a university or a company or a private person. And they join forces to develop the desistive device according to the need of the person with disability. And then they can prove their device in our competition and they can show their device how it is working and how is it um, performing in the competition to a, a public and a society. So we bring in this competition, we bring all the three stakeholders we have together. So it, we have um, at the moment, 120 international teams from um, 30 countries, mostly universities, companies, NGOs, and we also had a private person participating in 2020. They won the um, arm prosthesis race. This is also very nice. Then, um, there is also technology focusing on children, mostly um, at the moment um, in terms of rehabilitation. But um, it's, it's only a small step that these rehabilitation devices can like, be um, developed into um, a daily living situation. So as you can see on the on the second um, on the right picture, um, the child is in a home environment, but you can also see that this um, exoskeleton to support the children to walk are very like bulky and um, very um, uncomfortable maybe when they wear them a longer time. So this there is still a lot to do um, until this can be used or used by a lot of children in the future. There's also um, the PEXO, it's an ETH Zurich um, research device and um, it's called Schnappi <laughs> at the moment and it's for, um, it's a pediatric hand Alex exoskeleton, it's also used at the moment um, in, in rehabilitation but um, maybe in 20 years, in 2041, it can used um, in daily life to grasp, to, to support a child to, to grasp um, certain things. Um, yeah, this is a very short um, introduction to the Cybertron, but um, yeah, we are fighting for a world without barriers, not only the barriers, the physical barriers, but also the mental barriers in society that um, technology can support people with disability to, to take part in social um, and political life. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Thank you, Annie, for that fascinating presentation. Uh, so uh, our next speaker is Robin Christofferson and uh, Welcome to you. Uh, Robin is Head of Digital Inclusion at AbilityNet, which is an UK organization supporting anyone with disability or uh, an impairment uh, to use technology to achieve everyday life goals. And uh, Robin, you will tell us more about this, I hope. The floor is yours. Thanks, Eric, and thanks, Annie, for a brilliant presentation. Um, I'm as excited about the future of technology for people with disabilities as Annie so evidently shows us there as well. Um, Anne is going to kindly drive my slides, if that's OK. Just a, on a personal note, I'm blind myself, so uh, just find it easier to concentrate on talking rather than <laughs> driving the slides as well. Um, so, yeah. What's the technology of the future going to look like, say, in 2041? A lot of the disabled children today 
are going to grow up with amazing technology going forward. And the children who are, you know, children in 2041 are going to start life with fantastic technologies. Uh, let's have a brief peek at some of the technologies that are around today that are already really impressive and that are going to get only better and better. So if we look at the next slide, so there's some videos in this presentation and I'm not sure whether um, we had a chance to, because we tried these out earlier and there was no sound coming through. So either we've cracked that or I, I'm hoping and was able to upload the videos. I don't know. Yes, I've uploaded it and I'm going to try to play it. Brilliant. So just to set up this first one, um, Seeing AI, it's an app from Microsoft on iOS. There are similar apps like Envision AI that are cross-platform. Um, and let's have a brief look at what AI can do. For example, for someone like myself as a blind person today. Microsoft Research Project for People with Visual Impairments. The app narrates the world around you by turning the visual world into an audible experience. Point your phone's camera, select a channel, and hear a description. Sure playing, the I'm app recognizes started. saved friends. Jenny near top right, three feet away. Describes the people around you, including their emotions. 28-year-old female Thank wearing you. glasses looking no happy. It reads text out loud as oh, it comes into the view, sound. like oh, on good. an envelope. Thank you. P.O. Box. Or a room entrance. Conference 2005. Or scan and read documents like books and letters. The app will guide you and recognize the text with its formatting. Top and left edge is not visible. Hold steady. Lease agreement. This agreement executed. When paying with cash, the app identifies currency bills. 20 US dollars. When looking for something in your pantry or at the store, use the barcode scanner with audio cues to help you find what you want. Campbell's tomato soup. When available, hear additional product details. Heat in microwave bowl on height. And even hear descriptions of images in other apps like Twitter by importing them into Seeing AI. A close-up of Bill Gates. Finally, explore our experimental features like scene descriptions to get a glimpse of the future. I think it's a young girl throwing a frisbee in the park. Experience the world around you with the Seeing AI app from Microsoft. You stop it. It's finished, did you say? Yes. Sorry, because I can't see and I'm not getting the sound. So <laughs> just hopefully the attendees are. That's good. Um, brilliant. So seeing AI. AI is massively important today already for people with disabilities, whether it's, you know, um, intelligently processing the world around you by sound, um, you know, to being able to talk to uh, an echo device, for example, and understand what you're saying and then use AI to try and give you the right answer. Just think about, even though a lot of platforms are accessible, like a desktop computer, given the right adjustments across all the ranges of impairments, just think how much simpler it is when AI is driving the IO, the inputs and outputs, the interactions that you have to really help make those processes, those interactions much simpler and more intuitive. So AI today is really, really important. And it's obviously on every organization's agenda going forward, whether it's because they're a technology company and they're looking about how AI can help across all their services, or whether it's end users who have a disability, for example, or organizations whose stakeholders have impairments to be able to uh, dr better drive a prosthetic hand, for example. So this is huge. Watch out for AI. Over the next 20 years, it's gonna be massive. If we move on to the next slide, so we're going to show another video here in a second. Um, this is a real bus stop, guys, in London. So we'll watch the video, and then if someone could tell me when it's finished, I'll explain why on earth I am showing this video.
<laughs> uh, I'm telling you, this is how it works, man. There's a little camera right here. It's ended now. You're clear to go, Rob. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so why on earth did I show that? Well, this is obviously a very frivolous use of AR, augmented reality, and also of um, transparent screens where every sheet of glass is a potential, you know, computer screen to convey information, etc. Now, we were all on tenterhooks last week at the WWDC keynote, hoping that Apple would announce Apple Glass. Finally, it would be really good for um, so many people to be able to have access to augmented information as you move around in the real world. For people with a learning difficulty, it can label um, different uh, goods, you know, appliances around your kitchen, you know, give you safety information or information about how to operate your washing machine or dishwasher, for example, that already exists in app form using the camera. But to be able to just walk around, get navigation information, um, be able to have a helper with you who's not only talking to you, which my um, glasses do here. These are my favorite things at the moment, these talking glasses. This is how I operate the speech on my phone, um, walking around, getting uh, navigation information, for example, to be able to have things coming up on the, on the lenses as well for people um, who have got some vision is hugely empowering as well. So we're definitely going to see a proliferation of platforms. So we had the, the desktop PC, then we had mobile, where all of that information, all of the smarts, plus a whole bunch of other sensors can be with you wherever you are. And now we're definitely in the age of wearables, where AI, and in this case, AR, are able to work really hard to make um, people's lives easier today and definitely over the next couple of decades as well. Just imagine too, we hope that everybody on the um, session today is passionate about inclusive design. So what does that look like when, for example, you're layering information onto a sheet of glass and you don't have um, as much control over the background color because it's the real world that you're seeing through the glass. You know, you've got to be extra careful about presenting that information in a way that it's going to be as accessible as possible. And what will it mean mentally or kind of from a neurodiversity point of view for us to be bombarded with information, every single, you know, sheet of, you know, window that we pass, because obviously advertising, uh, the real estate involved in putting up posters and that sort of thing is at a high value. But imagine if every window that you pass is a potential advertising board as well. So there's going to be some challenges there in not in people not being inundated with um, information. And let's make that inclusive rather than oppressive. On the next slide, that's a picture of me wearing a different pair of glasses. This was before, you know, when things were normal, I was at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, and this is me wearing a pair of Vuzix Blade smart glasses, AR glasses, and they had lots of booths set up, one looking like a shop with lots of goods on the shelves. Sorry, one... Robin, good day. It's technical support. We unfortunately cannot see the slide. Um, Anne seems to be having uh, a problem sharing the slide right okay, now. Okay, no problem. No Thank problem. you. I'll just, yeah, I'll just talk to it. Well, okay, so it's just me wearing a pair of snazzy glasses that look futuristic and they do have those smart lenses in them. We're definitely going to see that um, being used more and more going forward. And then on the next slide, um, we may or may not be able to show this one. I didn't have time to send this one to uh, and to upload, but this is just a quick video clip of uh, Annie a moment ago was talking about Iron Man and how we're not quite there yet. Um, this is a quick video clip of Jeff Bezos of Amazon fame, fame um, in very much an Iron Man suit. Um, they obviously use that for um, moving large, heavy objects around in Amazon warehouses, etc. And he says he feels just like Sigourney Weaver, um, who's wearing it, because I think in one of the Aliens films, she had a massive robot suit on, didn't she? So yes, we're not there yet. Um, we, but we'll definitely be getting there in the not too distant future, I'm sure over the next couple of decades. At AbilityNet, we run a, a, an annual awards ceremony called Tech for Good Awards. And a recent winner was Open Bionics, 
who combine 3D printed prosthetics with kind of bionic capabilities, smart capabilities. So just like the brilliant work that Annie's organization is doing, we're very much aware of the fact that all of these technologies are melding together to really help people um, get the specialist equipment that they need, not just the off the shelf ones that you can get through your um, local health service, for example. And then on the very last slide is just a, if we were seeing it, I don't know if we are, it's me again at Barcelona sitting in a um, drone, a great big autonomous self-driving, self-flying air taxi. And these are already a commercial service in Qatar. Um, but it's just to say that, you know, technologies are here, uh, maybe not fully mature yet, but self-driving cars are going to have a massive impact on people with a range of different disabilities um, for a range of obvious reasons. And in that vehicle, whether it's on the ground or in the air, are going to come together all of the technologies that we've been talking about here as well. AI to help you get from A to B, um, AR to overlay information of things that you're passing or to provide educational services, whatever it might be, the future for the children of 2041 is looking pretty darn exciting if we can just keep the technology in check and make sure that it doesn't rule us, like with the um, challenges with mental health we have with the amount of screen time that people have, subject, you know, have subjected themselves to over the last 12 or 18 months. Um, we you know, obviously need to keep an eye on making sure that the technology is used for good as I mentioned a moment ago, um, and really helps people uh, get the most out of their lives, regardless of disability or impairment. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, Eric, perhaps? Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. We unfortunately did not get to see those fantastic uh, pictures, uh, but you described them so vividly so we didn't need to which was fantastic you were like the ai vision app yeah in, in your own audio <laughs> description yep. yeah. um so thanks a lot both robin and annie for for these uh, introductory presentations I, I now thought that we would move on to a kind of a discussion part so i don't know if we can have the whole panel here yes thank you so much wonderful um and well, uh, obviously, we have seen a lot of, of in fascinating examples of, of technology that can be used uh, for inclusion purposes for people with disability. Uh, but what, what, what would you say about how does technology foster an inclusive society? What would be the most important aspect of technology in this? And uh, feel free to, <laughs> I won't portion out the word. Annie, do you want to go first or shall I? I can, I can <laughs> Robin. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you you know, you have, I w we talk always about the barriers. So um, if you take physical barriers, if you have um, a, a child in a, in a wheelchair or you have a child with a prosthe prosthesis, and you have a group of children in school and you only have stairs in school. So it's always the, the, the child in the wheelchair that, that stays behind if all other children go up the stairs or they have to carry the child up or the child has to, to, to look for an elevator. So it's always, it's, and if this child might have a, a wheelchair that can climb stairs or has another technology that can, can support it to, to stay part of this group and, and go up the stairs with all um, their friends, it, it makes their daily life much more inclusive. And it's kind of, of um, uh, yeah, a respect and a social participation because you have to, to cut off what you are talking about, you just see leaving your friends. And this is, I think everyone can imagine how how sad this is. And, and I think this is one simple way technology can support inclusion that, that, that they have a choice to, to be part or not because 
often they don't have even the choice to be part of of, of a group and and mm. um, i hope that technology can can do the, make it easier in the future for them to to be a part mm. Mm. yeah I think, I mean, we all uh, subscribe to the social model of disability, I'm sure, where, you know, the, the, the problem isn't with the individual, it's with society and that society needs to make reasonable adjustments, whether it's a lift in, in a building um, or, you know, properly high, you know, contrasting signage or whatever it might be. It's really important that um, society makes those changes. Um, technology is absolutely helping, you know, whether it's... Um, using lidar to map city streets or indoor you know navigation within buildings etc so that people with a variety of different technologies can more easily find or navigate to get to where they need to go um, if people have no ability to be able to experience the real world maybe they you know have very significant mobility difficulties um, my sister for example is blind but also has very advanced ms multiple sclerosis so um, she can be in the chair for about an hour a day but she has um, great pain in being sat up because her um, being seated is very uncomfortable for her so she's you know 23 hours of the day in bed um, but she you know would with spatial audio and with the ability to be able to talk to the a lady i've got one here i'm not going to say her name um, you know there is so many more choices available to her so you know if people heaven forbid, aren't able to get up those stairs because that adjustment hasn't been made, then maybe technology could help them follow their friends, maybe in a virtual way. Um, VR is hugely powerful in helping giving people experiences that they otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, when it comes to um, you know, limb loss, for example, to be able to visualize with an AR, a VR headset on that your limb is still there can alleviate phantom limb pain which otherwise is you know could plague people with um, a missing limb um, so that you know there's some amazing uses of these technologies mm -hmm. i think also it comes as i mentioned before with some challenges too and ai is being used by you know bad actors to make all of our lives more difficult as well and one very okay. <laughs> now we're those, and we lost connection. Uh, those <laughs> distorted <laughs> images, and for me, I click on the wheelchair symbol. It's a odd, you know, choice of icon. But anyway, I click on that to get the audio version, and that's garbled as well. And this is an arms race to the bottom, where um, the uh, the bots using ever cleverer AI um, mean that the challenge to the humans has to get ever more challenging as well. Those you know num pictures of. Uh, traffic signs partially obscured by leaves, etc., will get more and more difficult to, you know, for a human to decide whether they can see a traffic sign in this picture or not, because the bots get clever and clever at, at doing it as well. Mm. Um, and the likes of Professor Stephen Hawking before he passed away, and another number of notable scientists were, you know, talking about the potential challenges of AI becoming cleverer than us etc so i'm just thinking you know 2041 it's 20 years away and these kind of conversations will probably actually become a bit more real to us as ai for example gets more you know clever and more human like going forward so yeah a bit scary but also mm. huge huge potential mm -hmm. do, do you think that there are any other risks with the supportive technology apart from the dangers of, of misusing ai uh, for example, uh, or have you experienced that some people may be intimidated by AI or high-tech solutions? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've got um, uh, an Echo Show 10 downstairs, which is one that can swivel around and follow you around the room so that you're always in camera when you're on a video call or if you're making a recipe and moving from the fridge to the to the oven that it, you, you'll always be able to see the recipe instructions. But my wife was not happy with this, <laughs> having the camera on in the kitchen all the time. So um, there is a definite wariness of technology today. Um, in some instance, with good reason, you know, there have been horrendous things that have happened in the past. So I think that there's always going to be a challenge between um, people's uh, 
lack of confidence in the big technology people and with good reason as i say um and the sort of privacy challenges going forward mm. um but if you were really really concerned about it then you wouldn't have any technology in your house at all these days because mm. that mm. ship sailed really to be honest <laughs> yeah and um so one of the of the main problems that i can i can not um not um, speak from a personal perspective. I can only speak for what um, people with um, disabilities tell us. And and for for um, for a, a woman, she was wearing um, a myoelectric um, arm prosthesis, and um, she um, um, is missing her left limb since um, since birth, and um, she hated it. <laughs> and she's not using it because all the technical features in it are so overwhelming and exhausting for her because yeah. um, there are sensors in the socket and you have to 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 move your your muscles so that the sensors can recognize um, certain movements and then they um, they um, do different grips or or movements, and and uh, yeah. So she had movements she doesn't need, and the movements she needed she she can't um, put in herself. She had to go back to the to the prosthetic uh, manufacturer, and so she said, "No, I'm not going to use it because then I'm it's all exhausting." And that's why it's very very important that technology is developed for for the user and together with the user because i mean you can you can just have a fancy technology whatever it is but if if the, if the person who is needing it cannot use it or it's so exhausting or so heavy or so uncomfortable it's not going to help or support and 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 does that doesn't make sense it's mm. a waste of resources it's it's a waste of everything and it's very frustrating because i think sometimes the people have the have the um hope that this um technology helps them and then yeah it doesn't mm. and this is um this is not a good way to go. So we try think, to, to make it a, a bit better. If it works, <laughs> mm -hmm. we will see in 2041, but um, yes, we try. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's one example where AI is hugely empowering even today. I mean, it's not perfect by any means, but to take to strip away a lot of the complexity um, from a PC or even a mobile phone to people that would otherwise be overwhelmed by the technology to just have a smart speaker where you can just talk to the air. You don't have to read a manual. You know, you can um, hopefully ask whatever comes into your mind as to, you know, you don't have to think about the wording or anything. I say it's not perfect, absolutely, but, you know, it's incredibly empowering for people to stay connected, to get information. Um, in some cases, critical information here in the UK, um, the NHS, uh, there is a 111 number. So you may know that 999 is the emergency number, but there's a 111 number which will get you through to a non-emergency um, NHS team who have a computer in front of them that gives you all kinds of information. You know, it's, so, it's saved so many people from having to call their doctor or go to their doctor because, you know, the brains of so many doctors have been dumped into this database. Over COVID, they made all of that available with a first party integration into the Echo family. So now you can interrogate your Echo and get similar information from that same database. So just think how empowering that's been. So I think that the bar is lowering all the time, but you're absolutely right. And you would, we wouldn't want to impose um, technology on people or who for whom they don't want it, or maybe they've got a lower tech solution. I'll never forget, we went to assess somebody who didn't have any arms um, for his computer requirements. And we were all set to offer him, you know, Dragon and, you know, high powered computer and so they could drive Dragon effectively and, you know, lots of training to get his um, dictation up to speed and learn the vocabulary that he uses, et cetera. When we got there, he had a, uh, a keyboard on the floor and a trackball on the floor and he was touch typing with all 10 toes and we came away recommending absolutely nothing because he was good to go but at least we explored all the opportunities so yeah technology is a brilliant thing but um don't you know force it on people and luckily it's getting simpler as well yeah and also it also suggests the importance of involving people with disability in the design processes mm -hmm. as well i suppose 
Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A forum, so I think we'll continue. We don't have a lot of time left, so uh, actually it's, oh, time flies. Um, <laughs> But perhaps we could end with, with one, one thing that might be of importance to the audience, and that is what, what could be the role of the healthcare professionals uh, or the researchers or the developers uh, in promoting te technology and inclusion for people with disability, and perhaps in particular children and, and young people? So, Robin, if you want, I can. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, um, one of our advisors, he is um, uh, probably cheeky, he said to me, um, inclusion is the freedom of choice. So, I think we have, I don't know how it um, is handled in the UK, but in Swiss, Switzerland, the, the healthcare providers and, and um, the, the social security systems, they have lists of of um, assistive um, devices for people with, uh, with disabilities. And they are very, very old. So we have the, the problem that, that um, there is um, good technology that maybe a person with a disability or a certain disability would like to use or it can help this person to, to, to get back to their workplace or can whatever but it's so expensive and um, on the list that is I don't know from from the 90s there's only a device that that can't do anything it's 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 very frustrating for them so I think that that um, that healthcare providers that um, governments and people with disabilities and researchers and developers have to to like be on the same page so it's not that that everyone has to have the 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 i don't know the ferrari um f for the wheelchair but like a, a wheelchair that is 2021 and not 20 uh, not 1991 so i think and it's 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 kind of a, a, a question of respect and kind of um, how people want to live. Everyone wants to have a new car, a new iPhone, a new whatever, but they they yeah have to take <laughs> a very old technology. And I think and and if we start like researching and creating a market and come up with new ideas and new technologies, it it will get cheaper and there will be a market. And there are many people that are interested and they have the right to have the choice what they want to have for, for themselves. And I think that's also, as Robin said, a huge part of society of every person living in a society to 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 work towards this this goals mm. completely agree so the world health organization the who have over the last several months been um reaching out to organizations across the um world in the UK here, Staffordshire University in particular, um, to survey, to review, to research um, stakeholder groups on the ground as to what a perfect shortlist should be for those assistive technology products to then get rid of this um, patchy ad hoc out of date approach where there are, you know, you can get a hearing aid on the NHS, um, on the National Health Service, but you can't get a screen reader, for example, and equally are as, both are equally important. And you could say, well, yes, uh, you know, screen readers are 700 pounds for JAWS, for example. Um, hearing aids are probably similar prices, but anyway, um, but, you know, disabled individuals are having often who aren't in employment because there's very low rates of employment when it comes to disability still today in 2021. So people are often having to pay for these assistive technologies themselves. And because they are, you know, being bought by private individuals or by their employers or whatever, the price remains high. Whereas if go if government stepped in and was able to bulk buy and make it available to all the people that needed it, then the price would come right down when you're talking about volumes of scale. So, you know, this is a no brainer. And we would definitely point everyone to the WHO. It's APL, I think it's the accessibility products list or something. And that's what they're exactly trying to do because there's a real, um, you know, 
uh, an illogical approach to what's provided free of charge. And it's a very short sighted policy because it disables people who need extra care and extra support, um, aren't given the same educational or employment opportunities as a result. So, you know, unable to contribute to society and pay taxes and that sort of thing. So, yeah, that's brilliant. Um, one other thing I would very quickly say is that 10 years ago here in the UK, the NHS embarked on a digitization process. They haven't completed it yet. So I can't interface digitally with my local doctor or other re you know, records or whatever. So that is desperate and desperately needed. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we have to stop, unfortunately. We could have gone on surely. <laughs> but I want to thank you uh, a lot for your for presentation and discussion. And also I want to thank all, all those of you who attended this session. And I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. But now you, it's Eric. time to stop. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. So bye.